my name is David Griffith. I'm the Director of Programs and Outreach for the LGBT Elder Initiative. And today's program on hospice and palliative care is part of our Doctors in series, which is a collaboration between the LGBT Elder Initiative and the Jefferson Department of Family and Community Medicine. Um, so we do these programs, I know some of you have been to these before, um, but that we do these programs each month, looking at a different health topic, uh, so we've, we've actually, this is our one year anniversary. We started this oh. last, uh, last April. So yes, thank you to those who have been part of it for a year. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're getting in the process of planning for year two. So really value your suggestions of what health topics you wanna, uh, wanna learn more about. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Beth Collins, uh, who is, uh, has been part of our, our programming, a uh, big part this past year. And I believe this is your last this will be your last Doctor is In it is. presentation yeah. with us. Yeah. So we're very grateful to, to Dr. Collins for all the time that she's given us this year um, and are excited to hear from her today about hospice and palliative care. So please welcome Dr. Collins. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming out um, to our presentation today. Um, I'm going to be talking about something that can be a little difficult to talk about. So if there are things you don't feel comfortable sharing as, a, as an audience, as a group, please feel free to reach out to me or one of the, the docs in the back of the room here um, to talk about any questions that you have too. So I'm gonna kind of start with a, with a few slides just to kind of review what hospice, what hospice is mostly um, and kind of what makes it different than palliative care. And then um, I'm gonna show a, a little video and then I'd like to open it up to all of you. Um, so certainly please feel free to interrupt and make it as interactive as you can, okay? So I wanna start by asking, have any of you, do, how many of you know what hospice is and feel like you have a pretty good sense of what it is, okay? How many of you have heard of palliative care and kind of get what that means? Okay, a little fewer people, okay. Um, how many of you have had experience with hospice? Um, okay, okay. I just wanna get the temperature of the room a little bit. What do you think of? And this is the question on the, on the PowerPoint. What do you think of when you think of hospice? Somebody gave a thumbs up, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. In most cases, it's sort of an end of life type of care and it's great support for a family and the individual going through the process. Great, great. So end, end of life and great support. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. My mother had cancer about seven years ago and Fairmore Hospital had their own hospice at the time. Okay. So it really worked out well. Yeah. I mean, my brother was a contact, and if they had any changes, they would let him know information. Yeah. So I wasn't, he wasn't always giving me much information. So I, so once I just called the hospice, I said, I want to know what you know, might be happening. And thankfully, what the person said might be happening didn't happen. Good. But, but I was grateful for the information. And then, Good. And then I met the a nurse at the funeral. Okay. But I think everything went well for us. Good. As well as it could be. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You kind of have to refocus what your goals are, I think, when, when you kind of enroll into hospice care, for sure. And what defines a going well. And right. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else care to share their experiences or kind of what some thoughts that come up when you think of hospice? Okay. So I want to start by, this is kind of intermittently working. I want to start by playing a video, okay? And this is from the National, um, Many oh geez. <laughs> this is from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Um, and this is just sort of a summary of what hospice is and um, we can kind of debrief after watching it. It's pretty short. Many people have heard the term hospice, but most don't really understand what it means. Yes, hospice provides care for people with a terminal illness, but hospice isn't only about dying. 
Hospice is about living as fully as possible for as long as possible with a team of compassionate people focused on alleviating suffering and pain. Hospice care brings comfort, dignity, and peace to help people with a life-limiting illness and provides support for their family and friends who love and care for them. You know, the research shows that some patients actually improve when they enter hospice. It's because of the intensity of the care and because people have stopped some of the treatments that often make them feel a lot more ill than they had been feeling. Here are 10 things about hospice you should know if your loved one is facing a serious illness. Hospice is not a place. It is high quality medical care focused on comfort and quality of life. Hospice is paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, and most insurance plans, and usually doesn't cost the patient anything. Hospice serves anyone with a life-limiting illness, regardless of age, type of illness, who you are or where you live. Hospice serves people of all backgrounds and traditions. The core values of hospice, allowing the patient to be with family, including spiritual and emotional support, treating pain, these cut across all cultures. Research has shown the majority of Americans would prefer to be at home at the end of their lives. Hospice makes this possible for most people. Hospice also serves people living in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And hospice patients and families can receive care for six months or longer. A person can keep his or her referring physician while getting hospice care. Hospice offers grief and bereavement counseling to the family and to the larger community. To get the most out of what hospice can offer, it's better to have care for more than just a few days. You know, you actually don't have to be imminently dying to receive hospice services. It's a benefit that we designed to care for people during the last six months of their lives. A person can remain in hospice services with certification from your doctor that you are still, in fact, terminally ill. The best time to learn more about these hospice facts is before someone in your family is facing a health care crisis. Okay. What questions do you, ha do you have about all of that? Yeah. Um, it seems like these days hospice is in the person's home. Do they still have institutions where you can go to? Yep, absolutely. So we'll talk a little bit just um, about the history of hospice and how it did typically start as a place where people went to, you know, when they were actively dying at the end of their life. Um, but you're absolutely right. Hospice generally takes place at a person's home. It's really set up um, and set up and meant for it to happen at a place. However, there are a lot of um, places called inpatient hospice units um, where, and we'll talk about a little bit about that, about when it's appropriate to go to a place like that. The other thing is um, it can often happen at a facility like an assisted living facility or a nursing home um, as well. So we'll talk a, a bit about that, but you're, that's a good, a good point. Yeah. Is it true that hospice means they take away curative services? So we'll talk a bit about that also. Um, so generally the goal for hospice is you know, when someone enrolls in hospice, we, you know, as a medical team have said, there's nothing um, we can do, unfortunately, to reverse the disease process, that we've sort of reached the end of what, what we can do to, to prolong life. Um, and that we, instead of focusing on prolonging life and eradicating disease, we focus instead on comfort on, on getting as much of a quality of life as, as you can out of your remaining time. So it's a, a little bit different. And sometimes with that comes, comes stopping medications that harm patients potentially or have side effects and no benefit with it. Um, so generally hospice does not involve things like chemotherapy or radiation treatment. There are a few exceptions to that, but generally that's, that's the rule. Yeah, yeah. So they do stop like prolonging treatment? In a lot of cases they do, yeah. Um, certainly if those treatments also treat symptoms. So we have a lot of patients who are on hospice for advanced heart failure um, and there are symptoms that, or there are treatments that they are on that 
prolong their life, but can also be used um, as, a, as a means of alleviating their symptoms or treating their symptoms. And in those cases, hospice generally pays for that. Okay. I do want to try to try to hit some of this. So this is a difficult topic to talk about, and I'll start start about that. I'll start with that. But unfortunately, most American, I mean not unfortunately, most Americans say that they would prefer to die at home, mm -hmm. around 80%. I'm not sure if all of you feel that way or if loved ones you've had pass away also feel that way. But I think most of the time when we think about a good death in the US, we think of someone who passes away in their sleep in the comfort of their own bed surrounded by their loved ones. I think that's kind of culturally what we've accepted as, as a good death. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, only about 40% of patients actually die at home. Um, this number is actually quite an improvement from what it used to be. In the 80s and 90s, it was more like 20%, or in the early 2000s and 90s, it was more like 20% of people dying at home. So part of the mission and part of the role behind hospice and palliative care is to help, help patients live the end of their life the way that they want, want it to be. And oftentimes that, in, that requires having difficult conversations, that requires um, doing things like stopping treatments that aren't prolonging or aren't helping and are hurting patients. Um, and that can, that can require a lot of kind of talking and um, touching base with patients um, and their families. Um, a lot of pe people, even though 80% say they would want to die at home, a lot of people say they would prefer to die in a place where they're cared for 24-7 by nurses and, and doctors and um, surrounded by the medical world. And that's okay. We're here to support that as well. So I, I do want to say that if you're not one of those people who, who sees the end of your life being it at home, that's okay, we're here to support that as well. Um, about 20% of, of patients die in a hospital right now. About half of people are hospitalized or spend some of their last 30 days in a hospital. And about a quarter of them spend that some time in the ICU at the end of, in their last 30 days of life. What do you all think about that? Does that sound about right to you? Does that sound like experiences you've had? Do you know of people who have said that they wanted to die a certain way and then didn't? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So hospice care started really kind of back when medical care was starting to become more aggressive. And um, we had things like dialysis, like breathing machines, like, like heart um, ECMO or things that can, can pump your blood for you. Um, uh, when all of that started to, to grow in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and parallel to that, um, a group coming out of the UK um, led by Dame Cicely Saunders, who was actually a nurse, a social worker, and then later became a physician. Um, she started working with the terminally ill. She actually had some um, chronic medical conditions of her own um, and um, started talking to people who were, who were dying and gathering their stories. And from what she was hearing from them was that they were spending their last days oftentimes in pain, often doing things that they didn't want. And from that, she developed uh, what we now come to know as the hospice um, model. So really hospice then, she started a place called St. Christopher's Hospice, which was in the United Kingdom. And, she st and it was essentially the first modern hospice and the first um, the first place where people could go to get good quality comfort care at the end of life. It took a decade or so before that caught on in the US, um, actually up in Connecticut with a nurse from Yale 
um, named Florence Wald, um, who started the first hospice in the US. Then it took about another decade after that before Medicare recognized the benefit in cost and the benefit in caring for patients um, to make it part of um, what was covered by Medicare. And we'll talk a bit about that, but there is something called the Hospice Medicare Benefit um, that is actually, <laughs> that, it, that actually um, covers 100% of, of hospice care. And that started in 1986. Okay. So hospice is, so kind of defining hospice, it's a specialized type of care for patients who have what we call a life-limiting illness. It's also known as a terminal illness. But um, terminal implies that death is certain, and unfortunately we don't know that for sure about a lot of diseases, so we call it life-limiting. Hospice is not a place, as it said in the video. Hospice is a, a style of care. It's not necessarily a place where someone goes at the end of their life. It's, um, it involves care from a lot of different people. So it's not just nurses, it's not just doctors, but it's um, people from the medical world, from the social work world, um, from the pastoral care world. Um, all coming together to care for the patient. So Medicare, the Medicare rules actually require that a physician, a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, and a group of volunteers be available to care for a patient who's enrolled into hospice. Um, and generally when you or a loved one signs up for a hospice, it, um, you'll, you'll see a group of these people and, um, and they'll come out to, to your house or where you, where you live to care for you. The one thing that I think is often can be challenging for families is that it, hospice, especially when it happens at home, requires quite a bit of care on the part of the patient's family, friends, and support network. Um, a lot of people think that hospice involves 24-7 care from nurses. I wish I could provide that, but unfortunately there aren't enough nurses in the world to do that. So when a patient goes home on hospice, it usually only involves a, a nurse coming out for an hour or so, two or three times a week, and certainly more often if, if it's needed. And there's a certain amount of home health aid hours that you can get with your hospice benefit as well, which helps a lot and can help with things like going to the bathroom, eating, um, kind of getting dressed, um, sort of those activities of daily living that we all think of. Yeah. I just have a question. When it comes to seniors and issues around their personal rights um, and family members involved, do it sometimes, um, like, decisions have to be made, and so who makes the ultimate decision? Because if they have, like, four children, one, two girls, or maybe a girl and three boys, mm -hmm. and whoever the oldest or youngest or you're right. Think, think, That's why we have a job. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, a lot of people at the end of their life don't have the ability to make decisions for themselves. So in Pennsylvania, there are state laws that require us to go to certain people um, um, for to ask who we want for for um, to provide care, um, or to ask, you know, to ask for medical decisions that we need to make for a patient. So first of all, if you have something called a power of attorney, or you have paperwork written out that says you want this person to be the decision maker, we will go to them first, okay? And they can be a friend who lives in Oregon, or they can be your son, daughter, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever, nice. okay? Um, if you don't have that, then Pennsylvania law requires that we ask people in certain orders. So generally it goes to a spouse first, and that includes um, same-sex couples um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and then we would go to adult children next. Um, 
then uh, if, you, if, you, if neither of those are around, we would go to a, a parent of a person, um, if they're still living, and then siblings, and then kind of down the line through that, okay? Um, but there are kind of ways that we go about finding who the right person is to ask. So if you have, like, like you said, like if you have four kids and they all want different things, that can be a tricky thing. And that's part of why, what we do in palliative care is to kind of get everyone on, on board with what would be best. And we try to get people to think about what would, what would the person who's in the situation, the patient, what would the patient want? not what do you think is best for the patient, which is a little bit different. You have to do some mental acrobatics for that. But great question. Okay. So we talked a little bit. Hospice is required to provide care from a hospice nurse, a physician, a social worker, a chaplain, and from volunteers. Sometimes it can also involve um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, psycho psychologists, um, and home health aides as well. Um, but again, this is a little bit different than kind of um, if you have somebody who gets home nursing care um, that might just have care from a nurse at home. So who is eligible for hospice and when do we think about offering hospice to a patient? The big rule is that if a doctor thinks that a patient has six months or less to live, if the natural course of their disease takes place, um, then they are considered hospice eligible. Certainly a patient can't elect hospice, can't enroll into hospice without making a decision to do that. So people certainly have no obligation to enroll in hospice, okay? And I want to make that clear. Yeah, yes. There's a lot of illnesses that you really can't put a, a date on. That you can't uh, prognostic, uh, prognosticate, yep. Uh, and how, what happens if it goes two years after? Right. So that's a very good question and one that we struggle with a lot because Hospice generally came out of the model of cancer care. And cancer, even though we don't do a great job at, at predicting how long people have when they have cancer, it, we, ha we do a better job with cancer care than we do with many other types of diseases. Um, so that was kind of where, where hospice grew out of. But certainly we care for people on hospice who have things like dementia that could go on to live for years and years. Um, for people with end-stage heart failure, end-stage end uh, COPD, renal failure, kidney failure, things like that. Um, it's difficult. So there are, um, there are a list of criteria per, for each diagnosis that we have to follow. Um, and that we have to look for um, if a patient, if we say a patient is appropriate for hospice. So for someone with dementia, for example, um, they have to be pretty near the end of their life and pretty, pretty, dis, um, pretty debilitated. So they have to be pretty much bed bound, um, able, able only to say a few words, um, not eating and drinking much. Um, those are kind of uh, components of for dementia in particular. So the the hospice medical director, the doctor who heads the hospice organization, is the one who makes the final determination of whether or not a patient is is eligible for hospice. What often happens, and we see this all the time, is that they can be wrong. So the hospice medical director can say, "Yeah, I think this patient has less than six months to live," but then at the there are these things called recertification periods. So every couple of months, you have to, the hospice medical director needs to certify that yes, in fact, they have a terminal illness, they continue to have a terminal illness. And people can go on living on, on hospice for a years. Yeah, years many times. So it's a tricky, it's a, it's a tricky, it's not, certainly not a science um, prognosticating people at the end of their life. Yeah. 
When, when some elderly go through the dementia stages, mm -hmm. is one of them paranoia? Absolutely, it can be, for sure, for sure. Because um, one of the ladies in one out the courtroom, she's from Baba, she, she was uh, giving us an update on her mom. And, mm. yeah. Dementia is a particularly difficult disease. We talk about two deaths happening in dementia. First, the death of the mind, and then the death of the body. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this, but hospice generally in the United States takes place in a patient's home or what they call home. So that could be a nursing, a nursing home, that could be a, a um, caregiver's home, um, that could be an assisted living facility. Um, if a patient needs active management of their symptoms, so they're very short of breath, or they're having seizures, or they are having excruciating pain, um, they can go to an inpatient hospice facility. We're lucky in Philadelphia to actually have quite a few inpatient hospice facilities. Unfortunately, in more rural parts of the country, these can be difficult to, to use. Um, but we do use them quite a bit in Philadelphia. Um, also, if a caregiver gets um, overburdened by caring for the person on hospice, there's a, a type of hospice called respite care, um, where someone, you've heard of that? Yeah. Um, where essentially a patient can come into the inpatient hospice unit um, and their caregivers can take time to care for themselves. Because that's something that is really important to us as as hospice and palliative care docs is making sure that we care, care for the caregivers because people often forget to sleep, forget to exercise, forget to eat, forget to take care of what they need to take care of because they're so worried about the patient. That's, yeah. That's a good point about the rest of the care. Because um, sometimes with the funding from Washington, D.C., you wonder, like, like the planning council for people with chronic ill, uh, the funding dollars for mm -hmm. the issue around well, who's going to pay? The state's going to deal with the respite care funding mm -hmm. stream. And like you said, it's not a worry because what you said with Medicare, Medicaid, that's like the federal side of it, is that right? So you, it's like you worry as a patient, they do, seniors do worry about those issues because it's something that concerns them. Mm -hmm. And they want to know, like, like, is there an issue, an alarming issue that, we're not aware of. Right. And I think finances can be one of the, the most difficult things when somebody is critically ill. Um, and the good thing about hospice is that 100% of hospice is covered under the hospice Medicare benefit. So Medicare covers it and most other insurances do as well. Um, the thing to know about that, unfortunately, is that it pays for just about everything except for a place to stay, which can be a big issue, especially for seniors who, are, um, who don't have someone or, um, to care for them. Um, so uh, someone to care for them for doing things like helping them get to the bathroom, helping them cook meals. Um, you know, certainly volunteers can, can help provide some of that, but a place to stay and actual room and board are not covered by Medicare. Yeah, and that's an ongoing struggle. Um, so hospice, pro so what does hospice provide? I'll, I'll talk about that. So again, I talked about nursing visits. Generally, they happen two to three times a week. Certainly more often, especially if there's a crisis. Um, there's nursing triage care with the backup of the physician 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when we enroll someone in hospice, we like to say that their hospice number becomes their new 911. So essentially, um, when you enroll in hospice, part of that is saying, I don't think that going back to the hospital is going to help me anymore. Um, and we can help manage, or hospice providers, hospice nurses, hospice doctors can help manage symptoms and help manage the patient either at home or at an inpatient hospice unit. Um, physician visits, like I said, and, and um, oversight of, of the hospice nurses, um, social work, counseling and planning, 
um, chaplaincy services, so pastoral care, um, medications, medical supplies, so things like gauze and wound, wound equipment, medical equipment like oxygen, hospital beds, um, some limited amounts of home health aid services. Um, and then one, one thing that I do like to highlight is bereavement support. So again, Medicare covers support from a social worker and the hospice team at large for an additional 13 months after a person passes away. Um, and then also, again, short-term care, either for symptom management or for respite care at a hospice facility. Okay, all of those things are covered by Medicare. And Beth, just to clarify on that, so the bereavement support can be anyone who's been identified by the, by the patient as sort of their support network? Exactly. It's not just yes, it's children, not just, children, no. Children. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Anyone who, who is feeling bereaved from the death of the patient. What does hospice not provide? Again, things we talked about. Um, treatments that don't help symptoms. So generally, there, there's some wiggle room for this, for sure. Um, but generally things, especially things that are causing harm to the patient or causing side effects that aren't tolerable anymore, most often these are things like chemotherapy. HIV medicines tend to be continued in hospice um, because they, these days, fortunately, aren't generally related to um, the reason that they're in hospice to begin with, um, and often can, you know, are not causing um, undue burden to the patient, aren't causing um, too much um, symptom burden to the patient. Um, yeah, chemotherapy, kind of radiation, those things tend not to be covered in, in hospice. Yes? Does hospice monies you might get for home health aids or uh, I mean if you're getting from other sources say Medicaid or something like that, mm -hmm. do they take that into account? So in, generally in so, so they, they do for sure in, in terms of how much hospice provides home health aid services um, yeah potentially yeah yeah Sorry, Dr. Crayer, did you? Yeah, yeah, but that that becomes a, a tricky situation for sure. So I don't know if everyone heard, and for our virtual <laughs> virtual listeners, um, uh, a, a audience member asked, you know, if you already have home health services at home, does that continue if you enroll in hospice? And Dr. Crayer, one of our palliative care docs. Um, said that at times there can be complexities about that and sometimes um, those services because they come from a different source of funding are, can, are not continued during hospice. Um, so if you have questions about that, we encourage you to reach out to a social worker or to the hospice agency uh, itself. They can help. So if you decide that hospice is right for you or for a loved one, kind of what do you do? I would encourage you to reach out to the hospice itself. Um, you can make a referral um, for yourself or for a loved one. Generally, more traditionally, it comes from a doctor and from conversations that we have either in the hospital or in an outpatient setting. Um, but anyone can refer someone or request that someone be enrolled in hospice. And again, the 
hospice medical director or the hospice doctor gives final approval for that. Um, a hospice representative usually meets with the patient and their, and their, um, and their support network within uh, 48 hours of the request being made. And certainly they can, I've, I've seen them take an hour or two to get all the equipment out and, and get things set up and in place if it's urgent. Um, it's pretty remarkable what hospice agencies do if, um, if the situation is particularly urgent. Um, how do you pay for hospice? Again, if you have, especially Medicare in particular, it's covered um, almost always 100% by insurance. So this is fortunately something that, you know, I, ca I care for older patients um, without uh, life-limiting illness, and I care for patients who are, um, who are at the end of their life. And this is one thing that I think, thank goodness, are, is covered by insurance. Again, the, the caveat to that is that they cannot provide a place for a patient to stay while they're receiving hospice care. Um, yeah, any questions about that? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understand. If you don't have anybody to help take care of you and you have to go into an institutional hospice, mm -hmm. is that covered? So it depends. So generally the room and board, so if you have to go to a nursing home, for example, um, to receive hospice care, the, 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 the nursing care that you get from the, from the nursing home is not covered by hospice. I wish it were, but it usually is not. It's often covered by a patient's secondary insurance. So sometimes um, if they're coming after a hospitalization, um, but generally it's, it's not. It's either out of, out of pocket or if, you're, if you qualify for Medicaid, um, Medicaid uh, pays for, for nursing home facilities. Yeah. Let's say you have to go into a hospice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that covered? So if you have to go into a hospice facility, Yes, that is covered. But again, a physician has to, has to say that there is good reason for you to be in the inpatient unit and needing active symptom management or that your, or that, um, your caregivers, your usual caregivers need uh, relief from their burden of caring for you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Are, are we talking just to Pennsylvania right now? Let's say you have a relative or somebody in Florida, mm -hmm. something like that. This, none of this applies, right? So actually, it does. It's federal because these were all kind of started by the Medicare rules. So Medicare is federal. Medicaid is usually state by state. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of the numbers, great question. I was just wondering, and statewide, Pennsylvania, our big state, um, and this is not a political question, but it's a question I, I inquire might want to know, because everybody said the barriers that do exist for, for health care is definitely there for people of poor communities and poor neighborhoods within our, within our state, not just our city, statewide. Now the question is, um, do we, for palliative care, is it the numbers, as far as the numbers, is it larger in the cities? in our state versus the counties or how, is, how I mean, is, it, is there a larger number here than the cities versus those little pocket areas for counties and areas outside of the city? You mean in terms of people enrolling in hospice? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Philadelphia has the most, you know, the most, po the biggest population and the most people enrolling in hospice because of that. Um, and because of that, Fortunately, there is good access to inpatient hospice care here in Philadelphia. Um, in some of the more rural counties, like the county where I'm from actually, there's only one hospice unit in the entire county. Um, so it can be, it can be more difficult, um, but, but most places have some agents, some, some um, hospice that, that helps. Um, but you're absolutely right, Philadelphia definitely has the most, yeah. That Pennsylvania can be a complex state because it's so diverse, you know. Yeah. Okay. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about the difference between palliative care and hospice. So palliative care is something that I think should happen at all stages of disease. Um, generally, kind of when we're taking consults in the hospital, we, we deal with symptom management and decision making um, for patients who have a life limiting illness. Um, certainly that can, if patients are, are, you know, are receiving chemotherapy, are receiving an, um, you know, aggressive, what we call aggressive treatments or on a breathing machine or a heart pump machine, um, certainly all of those things um, can happen alongside palliative care. Hospice care, again, requires a shift in goals of care. So meaning that um, if you're receiving hospice care, it means that you are okay with not receiving care that is meant to prolong your life. So essentially hospice care requires kind of shifting things toward prolonging, from prolonging life to improving quality of life, okay? That can be a little bit of a diff difficult distinction. So here was a good chart. So essentially, hospice care is on the left, palliative care is on the right. Hospice care is aggressive pain, symptom, and quality of life management. Both of those things happen. The, one of the big differences is that in hospice care, a patient has a terminal or untreatable illness with fewer than six months to live in the normal course of their disease. Whereas in palliative care, a patient has a life limiting disease, but it could be potentially cured and we hope that it will be. Um, hospice care centers on a philosophy that has a team approach to the, the patient and to the family. Um, and the same, the same goes for palliative care. So when we see patients in the hospital, um, it involves a team of doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, um, and volunteers, in fact, um, often. Um, and hospice care, the, one of the big differences is um, that a patient is not seeking curative measures or to return to the hospital. Um, palliative care, certainly you can still get cur curative treatment and get palliative care at the same time and you can still return to the hospital. If you yeah. Look at the street, instead of America, mm -hmm. they have, basically they have a palliative care uh, doctor in there, like they have the whole team, so they have people with their approach to, and it's everything basically for the patient to stay. I'm, I'm not getting them a plug, but, <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, I, I've heard their, their stories. Yeah, so they, <laughs> they get the commercials out there, that's for sure. Um, so most, most cancer centers now, um, especially with the growth of palliative care, have a palliative care team built into their cancer center. So all of the cancer centers I'm thinking about in the city certainly have a big component of palliative care involved with that. And that's usually because cancer involves, involves treatment that unfortunately causes a lot of symptom burden to patients. So people get things like chemotherapy that causes a lot of nausea and vomiting and pain often. Um, so that's kind of why palliative care goes hand in hand with cancer treatment often, yeah. But I think we at Jefferson do a pretty good job in addition to other places. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. What questions do you have that are kind of remaining? Yeah, absolutely. Says they have a stage four cancer mm -hmm. situation going on. Can that be reversed somehow, like through treatment or some form of treatment for that person? So generally, when a cancer is considered stage four, meaning metastatic, okay. or that means it's widespread, okay. we've sort of lost control of the cancer being in one place okay. that we can remove. Um, so sort of by definition, metastatic cancer is not curable. There are some exceptions to that. However, there are plenty of people who have stage four cancer and have l gone on to live many, many years. Yeah. 
Um, and a lot of that involves things like chemotherapy and radiation and immunotherapy, which is kind of a new, new frontier in cancer um, and things like that. Yeah. What other questions do you have? Yeah. Um, I assume that when a patient goes into hospice, they're encouraged to do some kind of a living will. Mm -hmm. Because at what point do you stop it with PD tube or whatever? And I assume PD tube yes. would still be on the list of things that would happen. It, it's a it depends. Um, one of the hospice medical directors who I work with say, says he never excludes anything and always has a conversation with the patient and their family. Um, because, um, so first of all, let me answer one part of your question, which was about kind of um, advanced care planning and living, having a living will. Generally, when patients enter hospice, it means that we won't do things like compressions to try to restart their heart when they've passed away. It means we won't put them on a breathing machine to help their lungs expand and contract and help them breathe. Um, again, to kind of bring them back to life and rather we would let them die naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so generally that goes along with things. Um, meaning the living will is really kind of specifying if you would want those two things. So breathing on a, or keeping your, your, um, your heart, or keeping to be on a ventilator and if you would want CPR. Um, and usually hospice goes along with not having either of those things. Because we, again, because we're focused on comfort care and quality of life care and not on keeping a patient alive for many, many, you know, for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing you talked about was um, kind of feeding tubes and, um, and things like that. And certainly there are certain times when those are completely appropriate and other times that, that they aren't. Um, so I, I think it, it depends a lot on, on an individual patient. We try to look at every, everybody individually bef before kind of making recommendations and <coughs> talking about things. Does that answer your question? Yeah, does that, and who makes the final decision, the doctor or? So the patient makes the final decision. Um, yeah, this is all, or the patient's representative, yeah. um, be, which is more, more common often. Um, so part of the struggle of hospice is that generally hospice Medicare gives a hospice agency about $150 a day to pay for everything that is involved in caring for the patient, which might sound like a lot, but when you add up medications, equipment, nursing care, physician care, volunteers, all of that, Hospices often have to make difficult decisions um, and say, you know, the Lovenox you've been taking for, your, for a DVT you had years ago um, and, um, and bothers you because you have to stick yourself every day, maybe that doesn't make as much sense to pay for anymore. Um, so there are, hospice usually involves conversations with patients about stopping certain medicines that aren't helping anymore. Yeah. Ask another question, Matt. Yeah, sure. Uh, in terms of choosing a hospice provider, mm -hmm. is that something that someone could sort of like shop around to different providers or yep. do they have to go through a referral from a, a doctor? No. So generally kind of our technique in the hospital is um, we give patients an option or a, a list of choices of where they um, uh, where they can potentially go for hospice care or what what agencies work in their geographic area because patients and families often feel very overwhelmed we often try to say you have heart heart failure I think this agency might work better for you or that you live in this area and I know that they have an inpatient unit that's near your house this might be a, the best option for you. So sometimes we, 
we make recommendations, but certainly it's up to you to, to make the final choice. One thing I will say is that Medicare um, has a, a great resource about um, and a list of hospices and kind of certain um, measures that they look for for ranking or for rating hospices. Um, you can find that through, um, I can't remember what link this, it is, but if you Google Medicare, um, Medicare.gov, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you Google Medicare and hospices, they, they will um, get you that information.